Hello Anna and hello to people listening. My name's Fiona and I live in Dorset. I'm 59 and I've got two grown-up children and I've got two granddaughters and really I'm writing this because I feel so concerned for for their futures more so than for my own as I'm you know I'm 59 now so you know I feel that it's my responsibility to speak my truth and I'm very grateful to Anna for giving me that platform to do that. So forgive me for looking down and, and reading, but um, I just found it easy, easier to express myself through my writing. I've entitled this piece, The Body Politic. The body has become a political instrument. That is to say, it feels like my body now relates to the public affairs of my country where I was born and have lived my whole life so far. We came thrusting headlong into the world as babies, gasping for breath, a, mo a process of separation from our mother, we must now go it alone. We take our first breaths, a monumental moment of establishing our autonomy in the world, and everyone is relieved and happy that the baby is thriving and doing what a baby is supposed to do, breathe the life-giving invisible air, oxygen that supports our beautiful body. Parents nurture the child, feed, clothe, love, educate, teach life's tough lessons, who to trust, what to mistrust, how the world works. It all starts with those first gasping and life-affirming breaths. Anyone who's trained in first aid knows that the airway is the first thing you check. Can the person still breathe? Is their breathing being obstructed in any way? If so, why? Is there a physical obstruction or a mechanical problem? The body and the very act of breathing have become political. Remember the definition relating to public affairs. Are we being obstructed from our very birthright that sustains and gives us life, our breath? Our bodies in the space of a few short months have become dirty sources of contagion, a mass of creeping rot that is a very threat to our fellow humankind. Now, our bodies have a secret weapon that is invisible to not only everyone else, but also to our own self. We have the capacity to infect and potentially kill other people, and no one can be sure who the infected are. Note too the widespread adoption of the word infection. We used to get the flu or catch a cold, but now we are infectors who may be infected too. We are being reprogrammed to believe that the world is a dangerous place, and more so day by day. We are passive recipients of the virus. Our bodies act as our enemies. So too do the bodies of our fellow humankind. No one can be trusted, not even our own flesh and blood, let alone strangers. Our bodies now harbour a secret weapon, a weapon so deadly that we don't even know it's there as we show no symptoms. We are all potential killers. Don't underestimate the effect that this assertion has on the minds of people. We are all culturally squeamish about death, almost to the point of righteous indignation that it could even happen to us at all. Culture churns out the belief that these days we all live longer and anything we don't like about our body may be fixed. No wonder we're all scared at the prospect of the one truth of our lives. In addition, death itself has been taken into the institutions, for example, hospitals, care homes and funeral parlours. Our deceased bodies in the past would have been cared for by our loved ones and in our own homes, perhaps allowing us to accept this transition in a more realistic way. Now it is a big deal. We are asked by cautious medical staff and funeral directors whether we wish to see the body, as if the body is now something to be afraid of. Most of us, me included, don't want to see a dead body. Our cultural attitudes to the body, I believe, have contributed to the relative ease with which the current situation has quickly made us afraid of our bodies and excessively critical of the bodies of others. They have become the enemy, untrustworthy, seeing is definitely not believing. This virus is so small and deadly that no one can see it, not even the specialised medical fraternity, who to my knowledge to date have not yet managed to isolate the RNA strand. I will leave the science to them though. The virus and its host, our body, is now in the political arena. Our bodies must now be managed by the outside institutions for the greater good. We're all in it together, etc. 
The way we relate to each other is no longer the healthy option. We must change centuries of relationship to one another in order to survive as a species. Our method of socialisation that has served us well for millennia will no longer serve us. Sociability, our very basis for survival, must now be challenged. We can no longer operate for the good of the group by being sociable. In fact, it is the opposite. We must regard our fellow humankind as threats. In spite of the forces that persuade us otherwise with daily doses of doom and gloom, I believe that most people basically are good. They are moderate and self-managing and all they want to do with their lives is live peacefully and happily with their friends and family and just get through each day as best as possible. Of course, we all squabber, squabble, bicker and fall out with each other, but we do this because we love each other and want to be relational with each other. If we didn't want this, why waste our time arguing? Our very ability to survive depends on our mostly cooperation and not on the dystopian ways of being that we are now being forced to live by. What will happen to our society if we mistrust each other and view each other as sick and capable of destruction? Whoever or whatever is driving this is, in my opinion, very aware of the psychological operation and we are being manipulated into the willing participation of seeing our friends and neighbours and strangers as lethal weapons. This is not the first time this has happened in history, of course, and you can easily read all about that. Personally, to frame the things that I feel so sad and worried about are my grown-up children and granddaughter's futures. I feel very afraid for them and also very angry. I am very angry that the sources of information available do not allow any kind of debate. In my view, this is a form of abuse and it feels like millions of people are being slowly tortured to a state of insanity by a very one-sided diatribe of fear-mongering at every opportunity. This is burrowing into my brain like a maggot waiting to transfigure itself into a new identity. This maggot is peddling a sense of defeat, powerlessness and affecting rational thinking and common sense. It's trying to persuade me that there is greater good at work here. When the maggot changes to a pupae, we will no longer be able to see what metamorphosis is taking place. Much like the pupae, everything that used to be out in the open area of socialism and discussion is being closed down and hidden away. That is to say, social gatherings are regulated in terms of venues and numbers, religion is reg regulated, all the arts are cancelled until further notice. In fact, all the places where people might get together to celebrate a shared cause and join together in their number is effectively shut down. There is another word we now use freely and that is the word allowed. Are we allowed to do this? Or we all say... This is a well-known instrument of torture, changing the goalposts randomly and without any rational thinking behind the measures. Cognitive dissonance. In other words, we know deep in our hearts and souls that none of it makes sense. And now the masking. Not for any proven reason, conducted by proper trials, which might include both qualitative and quantitative method methodologies, control groups, forums and the such like. Why is there no data? Where is the risk assessment? Has there been one done? Everyone is required to conduct proper health and safety risk assessment these days. Surely a policy that involves most of the population would mean a proper investigation and study into the risks surrounding the issue of face coverings. Where is it? It should be publicly, publicly available, surely. Symbolically and throughout history, masks may be icons of exclusion and inclusion. Think about it for a second. Who is wearing one and who isn't? And what might that imply? A mask will necessarily impede our breathing, our birthright, the first thing we do when we burst into the world to take those first breaths. Masks give a powerful, non-verbal signal to others. I don't speak to you and you don't speak with me. Link that to the restrictions in our lives, to our freedoms to gather socially. You do the math, as they say. <sighs> to conclude, this feels very dark and sinister to me. It's no exaggeration to say that I feel like Pandora's box has been flung open and all the evil is now loose 
and attempting to rise up like a dark eclipse blocking the sun. I don't have any solutions, but offer this. We need to stay strong in our own power, speak our truths and stay in the light. Keep yourself away from the maggot burrowing conditioning. Yes, inform yourself and consider all angles, but avoid the maggot for that maggot is determined to feed off your fear. Look at those dark shadows on the wall and say, yes, I acknowledge you, but you are an illusion. Remember your birthright. You are here to live, to be relational with others if you so wish. You were not born to be made to feel contracted and afraid. Speak your truth wherever you can. Thank you.